right. Well, it's 7.32, so let's begin with the group that we have, and then uh, um, other people will no doubt join us. Um, so welcome to the third session of uh, Jaya's course on uh, leadership and its contribution to um, sustainable ministry. So, um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Jaya, who will be leaving us today. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, it is a joy to be here together again for another week to do some exploration around teams. Um, and so just as Jen invited us to really be here and be present, I invite you to do the same in whatever way that you need to. So if you wanna just take a couple of breaths and get comfortable, I see folks have their tea and their coffee. Um, because today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking a bit about storytelling. And so um, I wish I could say that I was starting with a story, but I'm not. <laughs> but, you know, maybe we can get into that storytelling mind frame. Um, and so however you like to listen, right, with that kind of openness of listening to story, I invite you to be in that space. Um, I'm sure, uh, a lot, or at least I hope, right, that a lot of us have experienced the joy of a good story. Um, in our family, we talk about, like, we tell stories a lot. And, like, even just um, the... Uh, like the everyday stories, sometimes they mean more to us than these like big epic stories do. Uh, and we and we tend to repeat them a lot. And often what ends up happening is someone who wasn't present in the story, but has heard the story so many times, feels like they were there. And so there were parts, uh, there are times where I'll be telling a story and my husband will be like, yeah, and this happened. And I'll be like, oh, remember you weren't there because that happened when we were, when I was in college. And uh, we met in seminary. And so um, that's something that a good story helps us to do, right? It helps us to really enter in, to participate. And so that's um, what I want to be exploring a little bit about today is how we co-participate in story. Um, in this day and age, right, storytelling is more prevalent than ever. Uh, think about the ways that you can binge on stories, right? Netflix or Hulu. I'm a little embarrassed to admit that if um, there are things that are released uh, one week at a time now. I, I just wait. I cannot like wait for the next week to come out. I have to just wait for the whole thing to be there so I can watch two or three at a time or maybe like five or six at a time or maybe the whole thing if I've got a weekend. Um, but I mean, stories are so available to us, right? And then if you are on social media at all, you've got Instagram stories or reels or TikToks that tell a story in like very short time, right? And, and then we have thousands of podcasts that are available to us at our fingertips. Um, sometimes it gets overwhelming because people will say, I heard this really good podcast. And I'll be like, oh, I really want to listen to it. But I've got 20 other podcasts that I want to listen to. Um, I remember the first podcast that I really got into was the one Serial, which was, a, you know, a, um, it was a real a true crime kind of thing, but it, it kind of came out. And it was a story about these young people and of uh, a murder. And um, like, so these stories are super available to us. Um, so I'm going to launch my keynote. All right. This is what Mark Iaconelli says about story. And this is from the book that I had just mentioned. The voracious and continual consumption of stories can render all stories, even the most sacred, meaningless. And then he goes on to say, Oh, there we go. The wish to be lost in a story is a basic human desire. The attraction towards story is not simply for the hit of dopamine. Ultimately, what propels us to binge on story after story is the yearning to connect, the yearning to feel our deeper capacities for the pain and pleasure of living, the yearning for relationship, the yearning to share in the lives of others. In telling good stories, we can contribute to the collective healing of the world by inviting the listener to be a participant in these stories. That's what um, Mark Iaconelli's book is about, is about how stories save us, is the little subtitle. And as followers of Jesus, we're part of the story of his gospel, and we're sent to share this good news to others, right? The, the good story, what God has set forth at the beginning of time, um, that's what we're called to share in. And so storytelling is what helps a community carry on, right? Um, for many, many 
for throughout the ages, right? How communities have continued on and sustained is by passing down the stories of that community, right? So storytelling for the sustainability of the community is vitally important. And who we invite to shape, tell, and hold those stories is vital for the continuity and sustainability of the community and those stories. So last week I mentioned that in building and shaping our team, we want our teams as wide as possible, right? To have load-bearing leaders as part of our team, right? Even as different leaders may bear different weights, right? Um, but what, what we're trying to do is to invite as perspective into the story so that our stories can all be found within this one story of God. So these different perspectives are important, of course. They tell the fuller story of the church and also help us to know things that might not be obvious to leaders. They help us to know if our mission, vision, and core values are actually just words or things that we really live out. For instance, in our family, uh, in our church, right, one of our stated core values is that church is family, right? Um, so this is right from our website. Let me see, this is about perspectives and how different perspectives lend to one story. I skipped that one here. Okay, so this is from our website, God Sets the Lonely in Families. Um, the, uh, as we were relaunching, we relaunched our name and website at the beginning of this year. One of the things that we did was we looked at our core values. Were we living up to them? Were we living into them? Were we being like family with one another? Were we caring for one another and inviting others and helping lonely people to find family here in San Diego. And so what we did was we didn't ask people, do you think that we're doing a good job with this, right? Because, you know, to our face, probably they were like, yeah, right? But we did two things. One thing is we said, can you think of a, a word that describes our church, right? But then the other thing that we did was um, we asked them to tell us stories about how they felt Anchor and Hope, our church, was a family or how we set the lonely in families. Um, and other core values. And what we found was that um, time and time again, this core value of family was being upheld. We heard stories of visits in the hospital when a baby was born. Um, we have several families whose, um, whose families of origin live far away. So um, when there was, when they needed support, um, whether because again of a, a newborn or because of loss or because of difficulty, uh, our church members were able to step in and be family to one another, right? Um, they were there for them in prayer and in presence uh, at each other's big life events. And some of these stories weren't known to us, right, um, as pastors. And so what we had to do um, is we had to go around and collect those stories from people. And we wouldn't have known these stories unless we had started to collect them, right? Oh. It helped us to know, too, when we weren't staying on mission. When we first started our church nine years ago, we used the word diversity a lot. Uh, we wanted our church to be diverse, right? I mean, that seems like a good value, right? But how and what do we mean by that? And so a lot of people took diversity to mean diverse cultural backgrounds. And we had to take a good look at ourselves and say, is that uh, what we were? Or is that what we even wanted to be? In fact, we were mostly an Asian American church. And so we would ask people to tell us the story of their church and how they came. And when you heard people tell the story of the church, diversity and cultural backgrounds wasn't actually a, a word that came up often. Um, and uh, But stories of like feeling safe, stories of being able to be fully oneself um, were important. And those were the stories that were being told uh, time and time again. And so we realized that maybe that's a word that we had to put aside for the time being and learn to be unapologetically who we were as a third culture church, creating a space for third culture people to be free and safe to ex uh, express who they were created to be and called to live this life together. Now that's not to say that diversity isn't important, but these stories of, of diversity or non-diversity helped us to prioritize our focus. So it's important to hear the stories that our leaders are naturally telling about the church, and it's important to train our leaders or teams of leaders in how to tell these stories too, right? Um, so like we, I, uh, like in this picture, right? If, if we just say, hey, you tell your story to church and they just merely tell their part, right? Um, then all of a sudden you don't get the full picture, right? So part of the importance of telling the story is that this is a part of it, but then we train people to tell the whole story together, right? So it's not a diverse church, it is a family church. 
Um, an acquaintance of mine, Nicole Lim, Lim, she's the founder of Freely in Hope. Uh, it is a nonprofit in Kenya and Zambia working to heal victims of sexual violence and to see its end. And this started actually when uh, Nicole was invited to Kenya to take photos for a different NGO and um, the types of stories that uh, she realized that she wanted to tell through the pictures. Uh, growing up, she noticed that a lot of the pictures that were coming out of Africa were pictures of very sad children, uh, very hungry children. Um, uh, you know, of, of in, in immense poverty. And it's not to say that these things didn't exist, but she realized if she told a story like that, there is an air of, of um, patriarchy or colonialism that's being told into these stories and it's not telling the full picture. And so she decided that when she was going to tell the stories uh, through the photos that she was taking, um, that she would take pictures of joy, of hope, of smiles and laughter, right? And so that the invitation then was to participate in this story of the goodness of God and what God was doing in Kenya um, and to participate in joy and laughter alongside the difficulties. And so um, she really uh, also trains people as they come through her team to tell stories in this kind of way where there's much joy and hope uh, rather than merely sadness or, or despair. When we train our teams of leaders, we want to help them tell the full story of our churches, right? Stories of hope and invitation rather than despair or desperation, right? Stories of possibility and promise, right? And so uh, that we have to kind of change the narratives of what um, is, is uh, causing us to lose hope, right? To stories of hope and, and possibility and transformation, right? And so we can do that when we gather our teams together and tell our stories to one another and ask what others might see from their perspective, right? And then these stories then get told in multiple ways, whether it be person to person or through our social media, our websites, our photographs, but we really want to pay attention to how we're telling our stories, how we're training our teams to tell our stories, um, and then how we are deploying those stories to be told. The more people we have telling these stories, the more we are building and rebuilding towards trust and invitation so that people will want to invest their time, right, their talent and their resources into our congregations and our communities. right? And then our communal stories can help heal the rift between the people of Christian faith and the rest of the world. Right? And we can encourage one another within our churches to connect as part of our team. And I just, I want to emphasize this because there has been such a divide, as I mentioned, um, if you remember in my last session, there's been such a divide in how the rest of the world, uh, how many people in the world see church and Christians and how we might see ourselves. And um, the more that we can get out there and tell these stories of transformation, of hope, of goodness, the more we are doing to build trust um, in our um, in Christian church and leadership and um, the more that we're doing to encourage people actually then to find hope and tr uh, transformation and renewal through that. So where are we going with all of this? Where am I going with all of this? Uh, one of the ways that we can use story is actually how we talk about the finances of our church, right? Uh, oftentimes uh, in talk, well, I would have to say that many times in churches, I find that there's not a whole lot of transparency. Things are available and there's a um, that's not to accuse. It is to say that the, the will is there, but always like the form is not there to talk about um, like financial transparency. So we don't always know what's going on. The budgets are available. Um, but I think that there's a way to talk about story in our in our finances, in our budgets um, that gives people the full picture and invites people into it. So um, you might have heard of something called a narrative budget, right? Uh, a narrative budget is... Uh, <clears throat> It's a way to talk about your line item budget in a way that is relatable and shows a picture of how the church is stewarding or stewarding resources, right? So for instance, let me see if I, oh, <clears throat> I'll get to that in a second, excuse me. For instance, instead of talking about property, you might talk about how the use of facilities by an art group and the Boy Scouts and um, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, how the use of these facilities, right, allows for creativity and healing and beauty and nature and all these things to be nurtured and to flourish, right? Um, and so I first heard about narrative budgets through the PCUSA, which is a denomination that I belong to, but I was pretty sure that the Presbyterian Church of Canada also had some information on it and it was, right? This is from your website. Um, and so, 
we can see that narrative budgets is, has been a popular tool for a while to talk about our finances and our resources. Um, Eflin, as I sh as, uh, shown uh, right here in this slide, um, this process involves grouping your ministry items uh, or ministry into like items, right? Fellowship, mission, worship, education, right? And then charting them and presenting it with a graph or chart and then pictures, right? And that's the narrative budget. And that's what you kind of like give instead of this line item budget. And this is good, but I want to um, put a slightly different spin on the narrative budget so that we're actually talking about narrative or story as well. Um, so uh, how does that happen, right? In several ways, right? Um, on, on the PCC's website, I really, I really like this. It says, uh, because writing a narrative budget is more art than science, it requires some creativity or creative thinking, right? Um, this exercise, right, can and probably should be done in a group, right? And thinking about this creativity, we wanna invite, um, different voices, different represented voices as possible, right? So the pastor might think one way about the budget, the elder in charge of worship might think one another, a deacon in charge of hospitality might present another, right? And so you get a fuller picture of the church's story, right? So that they can help to shape the story. Uh, so one of the exercises that is often given to narrative budgets is to form this chart, right? Um, and while, again, it can be helpful and necessary, what I want to do is really encourage us to get creative in thinking about the stories behind these pictures, right? The stories behind our budget um, and, and to, to deploy people to talk about that. So rather than thinking merely in percentages and charts and then trying to put photographs there, I want to encourage you to think about the actual stories that your budget and inv invitation um, to participate entails, right? And then the second thing is to train people in how to share the narrative. These days, one of the major criticisms I see, again, in the church by young people is that the church is only interested in my money, right? I hear that um, quite a bit, uh, right? And so, uh, so the church, right, like they pass around the offering plate and then there's these accusations of like, oh, is the church you know, misusing the funds? How are they using it? So uh, when my husband was a youth pastor, he went one Sunday wearing a tie, right? Um, and it was this tie that actually his mother had bought for him. Um, and a student thinking he was being funny came up to him on Sunday and said, oh, is this where my offering money is going to? Right? <laughs> uh, although that seems painful and unfair, right? It is how people think um, sometimes, unfortunately. And so if we can train, uh, our, our leaders to tell the stories of our budgets. It helps people to understand why they're giving, right? Um, think about how some it is sometimes easy to ask people to give when the story is clear, right? Can you give money to buy books for children's literacy, right? Can you give money to bring this family into a house and make it their home, right? Or getting uh, food for pets and shelters, right? So it is important to train our leadership teams to tell our stories so that the invitation is clear and trustworthy. Uh, let's see, right, there you go. So uh, if we, uh, the more people we can tra train to rightly tell the story of our church, the more they will be able to invite people to give, right? Um, and so there's this, it's usually attributed to an African proverb. I'm not 100% sure. There's some like question as to where it really comes from. It says this, if you want to fast, go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Right? Um, and so telling these stories together, right, allows us to be able to go further, to sustain. When our church was running into some financial hardships about four years ago, we worked with our core team leaders to talk about what our church finances were doing, right, uh, with others. And so then what they did was they... They told those stories in the church and even to those outside of the church, um, to those that might be interested in some of our different ministries. And what we actually found ended up happening is as stories were being told, we didn't even have to ask. Sometimes we would find that people would give um, just by hearing the story or they would ask, how can I participate, right? And so there's an invitation in there, sometimes in telling the stories that doesn't have to be the um, like an actual invitation, right? It can just be inferred. Uh, so what I'd like to do here is I'd like to take a pause and do some work together. And so um, in our breakout rooms, let's imagine that you're a church team, right? Uh, you're 
um, going to put together a, a budget, right, for your church. And maybe uh, we'll call it St. Andrew's Zoom Church. I love that so much from last week that um, that's what I'm bringing up. And you have these five things, worship, mission, property, administration, and education. Okay? And let's just make it super simple. I know it feels like a small budget, but let's say your church budget is $100,000, right? And so then see if you can just kind of like separate these out into line items, right? Um, what would you do if you were doing a line item budget? This has to go kind of fast. I know that we're not, we're taking weeks to work on a budget as we normally might. Um, but then the next thing we'll do is work on a church budget together, right? Um, so uh, what kinds of stories might come from these five categories, right? It might take too long to do all five of these categories, so perhaps you can just pick one or two, right? Uh, what kinds of visual, visual images might you need? right? Who would you invite to uh, um, tell the stories of these needs, right? Where might the storytelling take place? Uh, what kinds of invitations do these stories suggest? And so I want to invite us to do that um, in these groups. And so I'm going to stop. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, <laughs> so I want to apologize because I just learned, um, I I thought that this was just a glitch the last time I was in a breakout room, but I guess um, a lot of the chat gets lost when you go to a breakout, which didn't happen, you know, it hasn't happened to me before. And so if it was hard to get the details of this exercise um, through the chat, I, I just apologize that that happened. Um, before, I would love to hear just a little bit of how your time went, um, but Glynis, to your, uh, in, in the breakout room that I was a part of, Glynis brought up this word testimony that I just really um, appreciate. Uh, in the new church world, we try to stay away from like uh, overly, like what we call overly churchy terms, right? And so then what ends up happening is that we lose a lot of things, right? And so testimony felt like a churched word, so we haven't really used it. But I like this um, reminder and return to it because how do we tell the stories of, of, um, of like what God is doing in our lives, right? To talk about the the needs that or the invitation to participate, right, in what God is doing. I mean, the testimony time during church, right, is has has historically been pretty powerful. So, Glennis, I just want to thank you for um, for bringing that up. And Jeff, I see that you have your hand up. I'd love um, to hear what's on your mind. Yeah, it's 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 uh, interesting that Glennis would have raised that because in our group, um, I shared that I had been aware of at least one congregation in PCC. I know there are others that use this kind of narrative budget approach on annual meeting day, um, and they tell their stories in worship. So the run through of here's what we did this year and here's how we impacted the community is given by committee conveners or whatnot in the context of the worship service. And then after the benediction, you go downstairs, you have tea and lunch and you vote on the budget. Yeah. Um, I also shared that, and our treasurer and, and chair of the building committee are both on this call from St. John's. Um, so the, they will know that we've had varying success, success with changing the way we present our financial information and how we how we explain it beforehand and the kind of prep work that we're trying to do so that the story of of our finances is a little bit clearer to people um again that's that's met with i've been i've been encouraged by it um i think ruby and marianne might suggest that the success rate was mixed but um, we're on the on the way toward thinking about who how we share the load about telling those stories and who gets to tell them and how often we tell them too. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciated both of those stories. I mean, that's right. Because story is naturally invitation, right? Um, invitation to a lot of things. And so, and I love too that the story uh, that in your first story that stories are a part of worship. Um, there's something sacred that happens in stories, right? Uh, I heard this uh, quote today, uh, yesterday about story. Um, they said, the story might not be hopeful, but the telling of it is. And um, I, I loved that quote. I, I wish I could say who it was from, 
Um, but that's kind of what is hopeful in, t in talking about these, um, in telling stories about our budget, right? Is that we have a hopeful story that people can be invited in to participate in. And so then to go straight down to like coffee hour, tea hour, and then say like, okay, here's how you get to participate. That's so great. Um, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Any other thoughts? How, how was your time together um, in your breakout rooms? Were you able to use this? Um, do you think uh, it's something that would be helpful for you in, in your teams? Um, Yeah, in, in, in our group, um, both Anne and, and um, Jean, we, we discussed uh, basically how would we break out this 100,000. We discussed uh, where we would put the money or where we would place it if, if it's related to an activity type thing. Um, and then, of course, who would we bring to uh, tell the story about that piece of the budget? And that would be the person who's like, you know, the head of that group. Um, so if it's, you know, the education piece, then it would be the Christian education coordinator, or if you have a youth minister, or, you know, you could do a combination of both. But there was also one, um, and I think it was Jean that said that you, there was a video done. And, and so it was kind of bringing it right to the people. And they produced this video to say, you know, here's what we've done, here's what we do, kind of thing. So I thought that was a really good um, way to do it. And then when to kind of bring this about is is um, throughout the year because Anne said if you do it all at once then people tend to forget oh well you know what what did we do when did we do it you know how did we do all that kind of stuff so when you do it throughout the year and you present you know here's where your money's going um, and then we would kind of then do a like a recap at the AGM before you present the budget for the following year to say okay now remember what we showed you throughout the year of where your money went now we're kind of on the same trajectory to look for you know these programs where we want to do our ministries and then so they, they they've seen throughout the year where that money has gone the benefits what has brought about and then a recap at the AGM so it kind of twigs their memory to go oh yeah okay and then they understand exactly where that stuff has gone um, the only piece that really wouldn't have a, um, I think, where you said the, the quote about the story may not be hopeful, <laughs> yeah, but the telling of it is, um, would be your non-tangible things that you, can, you can't you can see and feel, which is your building and your administration um, type thing. And nobody likes to talk about those because it's like, oh, yeah, you're just, it, it's a money sucker, right? And that's what it is. Um, but it's a necessary piece to have your building and, and all of that kind of stuff in order to, you know, um, present your ministries and, and carry out your work. Yeah. Ruby, those are all such great points. Like, I really do love, I think it, many times, uh, like right now in, in it's May, and so there's like a big give in May, May campaign going on uh, for a lot of the nonprofits that I, I work with um, here uh, in in Southern California. And that's like the one time. And then like right after our American Thanksgiving, right, is the other time, like Giving Tuesday are the two times that we talk about like giving in like a real way, right? And so then you only get this reminder like twice a year to like, oh yeah, there are these things that are going that, that we should be giving to, right? But if you can do it consistently, right? And not just like, here's the report, of, like quarterly report of how we're doing our budget, but like here are the stories that are coming forth, right? from the way that we have set forth our budget and all of you are participating in it, right? That's one of the most important parts of storytelling is that it makes it feel like it's not just the like the, the leaders, right? But all of us as a church in a team, right? Like we're, we're telling it. And it's not just the pastor, right? But it's the other leaders who are also telling these stories. Um, then there's more invitation for participation and for hopefulness and to build. And so I love that, um, Ruby, that reminder that we should really be telling these stories more than once a year, right? Not just at the stewardship like month, right? But um, you know, you could say like, oh, wow, you know, we all get to this and here's a story of how it's impacted us. Mm -hmm. um, for, and I think the one thing that storytelling kind of helps us to do is it helps us like those things that we you mentioned, like buildings, right? Um, how do we tell a story around that? And if we can get our teams to creatively think together about how we present the story of this building and not just like the history of it, right? Well, you know, this building came about in like 18 something and it was like really beautiful and they raised... Um, you know, we raised the roof together, you know, but like even now, like the impact of story of like 
here's why this building is important. And here are the stories that are coming out of this building. And here are the ways in which you can participate so that this building can continue. Um, that's where the power of, of the story lies. Um, so, um, so hopefully we can do that together in our creative teams. Um, and here's some, like I, Jen, I love this conversation that you and side conversation that you and I are having for a bit about creativity being learned. Um, I, I love to tell the story of when I was uh, five years old, my mom set me up for an art class, right? And you had to take an art test, right? Um, and a five-year-old taking an art test, you're probably not going to do very well. My brother was seven. And so we both took the same art test and he got to be in uh, the regular art class. And then they put me in modern art, right? And what this meant was I didn't know how to draw and I would probably never learn, right? And so therefore I got to be in a room where they asked us, look at this tree, think about how this tree feels, now draw those feelings as opposed to draw this tree, right? Which I thought that's what I was gonna learn how to do. That's like, now that I think about it, that's like a beautiful exercise, right? How does this tree feel? Like, how would I draw these feelings, right? But back then I was like, oh, wow, this test in this class is telling me I am not a creative person, you know? I'm not an artistic person. And so I just was like, but not going to draw, right? Um, and so I think I might have mentioned that I'm taking an art class and I'm learning that for like extra, extra beginners, right? Like you, this is the art class where like, wow, I can't even take a ruler and draw a straight line, right? <laughs> and so I'm taking this art class and I love it because um, I'm learning that even though I'm not the best artist and I never will be, and you'll never see anything of mine in a gallery or a museum or even hanging up in my house if I have anything to do with it, uh, that I can learn to be creative and that creativity is something that God has given to all of us and can be unlocked and unleashed. We're good, right? And so it's the same with the storytelling, right? As we do this in groups, as we, and um, part of, so, so, our, uh, so part of it was uh, in my conversation with Jen is just being around like other creative things and being inspired by other creative people, right? Um, or, you know, other non-creative people who are working towards creativity even, but just that communal team aspect helps us to build our creativity. And so then where we find that um, maybe we couldn't quite see outside of the box, right? All we're seeing is our needs. Once we're together with people, once we have our team, then we can learn to be creative, right? Um, together. And the smaller... Uh, we start with small steps and we um, can go into bigger ones. And so I just want to really encourage you all, as you think about this, that the team aspect of, of creativity and storytelling is so important um, for the system. And that's going to really lend to that sustainability that I know we're all after. Um, so that's that's the end of my spiel for today. Um, <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Jen, who I'll invite to close us out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dia, for this inspiring time. And uh, we'll see you all, same place, the same time next week for our final session with Jaya. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have thank a good you. Day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good to see you all. Bye now.